So our final reading is about how all of what we've studied affects women in particular. And I hope you understand the article, it refers to ideas and an attitude that started the first day of class with Bacon, Knowledge is Power, and with John Locke's theory of property that the natural world itself has no value because it has no market value. And a rational and, and industrious person exploits natural resources to create a product that they can exchange for barter on the market. But of course, that became exchange for money. Sorry, Mr. Locke, it didn't work out the way you wanted. And um, money sticks to money. We have an international capitalist system. And the system still functions on that same paradigm that the natural world is not has no value because it has no market value. And so this is particularly hard on women because women have been in charge of getting drinkable water, um, getting feeding, you know, subsistence level feeding food, um, and they suffer the most. So women have been um, connected to the cycle of life the most. Um, they, they're having children, you know, and reproduction, and then a, another baby's born, that's a cycle. But then especially they've been uh, connected to the cycle of the earth and sustainability because her, their concerns have been so immediate, right? They've got to feed their babies and they create products that stay connected to natural resources. Um, and so when the male system comes in there that says nature isn't worth anything, it's you have to exploit these resources and create uh, manufactured project products. That's what a rational and industrious person does, which was male. Um, that gives it value. And even when there's all this data that we are actually, we have to let the bees pollinate the flowers. We have to let the trees do their thing. Like we have all this data that if we just left nature alone, she would be able to maintain the resources from which you make these products a lot better than any sort of technology can do. But still we're stuck in this paradigm. And so the, the main point today is that this impacts women so much um, and so negatively. And so previously the paradigm was, okay, we're gonna have this international development and when the corporations go abroad, we'll be able to lift everybody in the world into the middle class. And uh, that will include women. And so the people in charge would talk about women's rights and women's equality or women's getting engaged in public life, women being able to have jobs and uh, that make more money for their families. It all sounded really good. <laughs> and the author says, wait a second, rights depend upon if you have money <laughs> or property, you know, you don't have any money or property, you don't have any rights. Um, and what's happening is the depletion of resources um, is making a lot of women's lives a lot worse because they have to go farther away to get kindling, right? Uh, firewood, 
and they have to go farther away to get clean water. And so they're traveling longer distances than they used to have to. And the resources where they are, right, due to the land isn't as aerable, all these things, they affect everybody, but women suffer more than men. So this appearance of helping out women, lifting, you know, all boats will rise, women will have be able to work outside of the home and they'll be able to make their own money and they'll be more independent. That is just not true for most women. Um, and then because of ecological deterioration. So the well-being of women and the well-being of the earth are closely connected for most women. Um, then the model that Poverty means not having a lot of stuff <laughs> is just not true, right? Um, poverty has been defined as not being able to be engaged in this market economy and this whole economic system where you buy processed foods and everything you buy has had the hand of manufacturing and industry um, has created the product. And so the idea that that's a higher quality of life is just not necessarily true. Um, houses that are made with bamboo or natural resources are better than concrete houses, uh, or you don't need to have a concrete house to have a nice house. Um, clothing that's made out of natural fibers are better than clothing that's made out of synthetics and food that just comes right off the trees or out of the earth is definitely healthier than processed food. So, but especially that fact that women have to travel farther and farther just to get their wood to burn, uh, to cook, and also the water, that, that's really serious in a lot of places in the world. Um, so, so my first point is it just goes straight back to John Locke's view of property. And it's, it, at this point, it's just a disease, right? We cannot get over that way of thinking. And um, a lot of people in developing countries, they have had their minds colonized. They accept it. They don't think twice about it. Um, another point that was made was that women, it, the market economy, the kind of products that it sells, you never even ask women what they want. And a lot of women don't even think about how it could be different. They just accept it. They don't imagine, you know what I really need? And there was this um, public radio little clip about uh, women, two women who had created their own company um, because the market didn't sell a product that they needed. So the theme of that podcast was, have you ever needed something and it wasn't on the market? So you started your own company. And in this case, it was two women who created the kind of hijab that they needed for their jobs or their interests. So one woman worked in a hospital and she was a surgeon, surgeon's assistant, but it wouldn't matter. She could be a surgeon. But anyway, she got blood on her uh, dress, but there was a replacement dress. It's just that there was no replacement hijab. And she thought she wanted a medical, um, grade hijab. And so she designed one that had um, was specifically designed for working in a hospital. I can't remember exactly what features it had, but it had certain material and it had it it went down a certain length, but not too long. 
and not too short or the way it wrapped around was something that you needed if you were going to help with surgery, if you're going to do medical hospital kind of work. And then the hospitals ordered those so that women who work in hospitals would have those extra heat jobs available if they soiled the one that they were wearing. Um, and it's an international company. I cannot remember the name of it. Um, well, I'll think about it. Then there was another woman who was in sports and she needed one. Uh, she was a coach or something and all of her teammates were complaining. So she made one, which is, this is pretty obvious, like the Olympics has some women. I think the first woman with the hijab was a fencer. She was in fencing um, and I can't remember, it was a Mideast country. I think there are a number of them now. But anyway, so she made a kind of hijab that's not too long and it doesn't flop around. And it also has material that doesn't get too hot, right? That's what I would think women in these countries near the equator that are so hot. It just seems like they would really want a hijab that has made of material that breathes a little bit, you know? It would really lower the temperature, right? Would really cool them off pretty well. So I would imagine that that's gonna be a huge market product um, moving forward because more and more women are doing these alternative things um, and they definitely need it. And they've always really needed it, but they've never had it, right? So that's another, issue is the market keeps trying to sell stuff to women. Um, and I think last time we talked about that, that the market has to make women feel insecure, like they absolutely need something. Um, but this is, this article is just saying that, yeah, it reinforces that, that doesn't occur to women, that the products on the market First of all, they aren't something they need. And second of all, that the whole market economy itself is making them poorer, right? It's making their lives more impoverished in a lot of different ways. Um, and this isn't true for every woman. It's probably less true for college educated women, right? So that just means college educated women need to look at women around the world, you know, all women. So they would try to identify with, you know, all the women and look at statistically how many women are suffering because they have to walk farther to get clean air or to get um, kindling to cook with. Um, anyway, so that's kind of what, where I want to end up today, you know, this is the last lecture, and uh, just to wrap it up, but the, you know, the main point is that everything in the class weaves together, right? It's all a dialogue, and so that, that's my main point. So I think I'll ask each of you what your reaction to the reading was, and then I'll, yeah, I will talk. I mean, I'm good at talking, but part of this talking, jabbering, is to, for the students who just have mostly taken the class online. And so to just keep reminding them so they don't feel totally lost, right? What is this reading? You know, how am I supposed to contextualize this? So I, I would like to spell it out a little bit um, for the students who are cannot get to the class. Um, <clears throat> so, Ramisha. Oh, I'm sorry. I was. Oh. I want to start first. Yes, go uh, ahead. Just yes. in case I have to go. Of course, Rossi. I should have thought about that. Go ahead. So, for me, um, when I was reading, and they were saying that these women have to travel longer distances to get the candle and to get water, it reminds me of my mother. Like my mother, 
decades ago she used to do that before like wells and anything she has to travel for at least three kilometers with two, uh, one bucket in front and one bucket behind and she has to carry water and then with technology and with um, innovation we are able to have our own bus at home so water becomes easy uh, it's easier to get access to water however we are pr producing more pollutants and um, we are causing more harm to the environment because when we use the electric motors to pump in water, we are not only polluting the air, but we are using um, energy that's not clean. It comes from coal and fossil fuel. So I can see that um, long ago, even though my mom has to travel three kilometers to get water, it's clean and it's environment environmentally friendly like she lives with the ecosystem but now that we have easier access to all these supplies we are harming earth way more than we think about it and so in a way i feel like if we can revert back a bit and use those traditional methods we go to carry water from like the pond and stuff um, without the harmful fertilizers it would have been so much better for earth and for like our health too okay yeah it's it's complicated to try and find a solution where women don't have to walk all that way True. Right? but yeah. without um without in a carbon free way right mm -hmm. it's it's a hard like a hard thing to do like to get what we need and also do it in a clean way like well we yeah and then you, I mean you could just start brainstorming but um you know a kind of bicycle a kind of three-wheel bicycle maybe right where yeah yeah you know, but then it like, to be three-wheel because you have those buckets so you 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 know just some way to to make um, the trip faster They'll be like, why waste the time to go on these trips when like there's innovation created to ease your life, you know, like when mm -hmm. you didn't have any form of innovation, then you'll think of like eco-friendly ways to get what you need. But with these innovation, people become lazy and they become dependent on the like faster methods. And so, yeah. Well, and I also don't want women again to bear the brunt right true yeah um, me neither like yeah they they might have other things you know they want to do mm -hmm. um but on the other hand if it just gets to the point where it's really just getting the amount of exercise you would need every day anyway you know yeah that would anyway that's the kind of stuff where Really, it just takes deliberation. It takes what Aristotle would call practical wisdom. You just solve problems. So that's what, in the end, all of you, um, I do want you to think about your vision of an environmental ethic, but also moving forward, you're gonna spend most of your life just solving problems, right? In your context, right? All sorts of problems. But this course just gives you that layer of environmental stuff is part of what you're in the midst of and there will be environmental problems specifically you'll have to solve but um professionally you know yeah. in in college you learn the theories and the trends and this overall and then in real life okay <laughs> that makes sense rossi Yes, Dr. Beck. Like it's a completely different story in real life than like the theories. But I do think the theories are important so that you can contextualize stuff. Yeah, definitely. Like it's kind of in a way it gives you background of like what you have to get ready for in life too. Also changing the paradigm. Like we have to change the way we think and it just keeps coming back. Does that make sense? Yes, Dr. Beck. It's so dysfunctional. <laughs> and uh, so I think maybe uh, just the fact 
the facts on the ground are hopefully going to drive innovation. And I hope people understand that they really need to change the paradigm. They can't just keep saying, oh, we'll use science and technology to extract a different thing from the earth and we'll save the world that way. <laughs> yeah. Or will someone will make billions of bucks on gas masks? Hey, yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll have fake air to breathe. Okay, who else would like to go next? I like it when people bring in specific examples too. I think that's really nice. Um, anybody want to go next? Okay, Shazneen, my old student, are you there? Yes, Professor. Um, um, I just want to react to Rasi's, uh, what Rasi said, actually. Um, I was writing a paper yesterday um, based on water security in Bangladesh. Um, and I came across this article about that spoke about the gender bias when it comes to climate change as a result of water insecurity, because uh, women are subject, well, women are responsible. I think uh, there was this statistic that, that said um, in the rural areas of Bangladesh in this specific study, 90% of women were responsible for, you know, um, collecting water for their households. And then they, they undergo so many, you know, social pressures and, you know, issues when they fetch the water. Because so on the journey, they sometimes, you know, face sexual assault, and then they have health complications because of walking up and down and you know staying in the queue. Um, and then if if they don't do it, they and uh, also during the drought they have even added pressure and then sometimes they are subjected to abuse by their husbands for not being able to collect enough water. And in the case of girls, like young girls and boys, they have to sometimes um, skip school, um, you know, and ed other educational activities um, just, you know, fetch the water. In I think in some areas of the Rohingya, it takes like hours, like one to three hours. I think some people even take three to five hours to just go get water. And uh, according to the goal 6.1 of the sustainable development, the UN sustainable development goals, the round trip to, to achieve basic, you know, the basic, um, you know, service level of drinking water it's you're supposed to only spend 30 minutes on a round trip including the queuing time so like majority of Bangladesh is spending way more than that and it's just only affecting women more than it is affecting men it's because of the gender bias do any men I guess you said 90 percent yeah. Um, yeah, men do it some uh, sometimes, but the study said that men do it only when there is so if they're divorced, like there's no women in the house. Yeah. Um, okay. Then only when women aren't around, or their or their wives are pregnant, or you know, like just have just given birth, or they're sick, then men do it. Yeah. Oh, that's not good. Um, Sristi, do you have a reaction? I'm sorry, Professor, I couldn't go through the readings this time. Okay. Uh, Sauda? Um, yeah, yes, Professor. Okay. So, um, for me, like, uh, when I was like uh, reading up the article, the thing that I, like picked my interest most was like the uh, effect of like colonialism and how, and when it was like talking about all the condition and like how it helped uh, condition our ecology and development 
and how it's like the even though it was called development it was in the in the end you know in, in the bigger picture the development was more like destruction than development because although there's like objective materials and you know easily available materials that like these people's life there's also like destruction of uh, nature that's coming with that so-called development so the air is getting more polluted more all the rivers are getting polluted so there's less uh, drinkable water and in all of air quality is also down and all of those kind of uh, uh, turns into a destruction of resources rather than development in the big picture. So it was like really interesting to me because it kind of really fit into our situation, at least in terms of Bangladesh, I would say. So it was really very fitting to our scenario. And coming to like feminine principles and like all the development enduring. So for our, us in Bangladesh or Indian subcontinent, after the like, uh, while I was reading, I was relating it to the uh, British rule and how what the deal did to our uh, society. So in, it's kind of like uh, uh, before the, uh, during the British rule, they, they, when they came, they kind of uh, did a lot of, I mean, they did good for the women in the society. So we, uh, in, during colonial rules, we had like Indian had a lot of, obviously as always, it was case in like everywhere around the world back then, women were like second class citizen, citizen there. So, and also in terms of India, we had like very, a lot of uh, barbaric or like uh, societal, like, cult like if we see it in a cultural aspect, we had a lot of practices that were really, cruel to women such as like uh, the sati pro, uh, like practices and stuff. So after the British rule, they kind of abolished a lot of those cruel practices, but they also kind of like solidified the caste systems from uh, Hinduism. And already in the caste system, we had like, they had, uh, in each caste, the lower caste people, they were already like, there's like four, uh, so without going to, into too much details, there's like a four kind of uh, caste and the lowest caste, they would always be like treated really, really badly. They would be considered like the lowest of the lowest class of human beings, not even human beings sometimes. They were, they would be like treated almost as like slave or like an animal kind of. And women in particular in lower castes, they would be the lowest of the lowest class of citizen. So which kind of, even though women, uh, there were like barbaric practices stopped and a lot of in those sense, uh, it was a lot of help and improvement for women but also solidifying the caste system and making it, uh, taking those uh, customs into law, making them into law, it also like sol made things harder for women. So it's kind of like a double-edged sword, I'd say like it, it did some good, but it also did some, a lot of bad things. And obviously by, uh, uh, even then, British rules, even, even in Britain or like Western or European sense, women didn't have a lot of freedom or rights. So obviously those kind of came into it as well. So it was really, you know. Right. So actually, you know, 
every kind of social change is going to be complex, right? Or in any kind of social uh, conservatism, right? Not changing is going to be complex. There are going to be advantages and disadvantages. I think what I, what I um, hold people accountable, though, is when they get fixated on something and they can't grow and they can't change and they can't adapt and they just keep re repeating the same old mantras like Locke's view of property. You're not trying, right? Uh, you know, any sort of change is going to have its pros and cons, but definitely you need to move forward. So if the goal is human flourishing, we do have to keep adjusting and so when you get fixated on something well it has to be Locke's view of property and it has to be money based and it has to be blah blah then you do a lot of damage in the name of something that might have been good at one point and it might have moved people forward at one point but now it's doing harm so um when Vandava Shiva writes this, she writes it, you know, um, mostly as the negative impacts, but there's, yeah, there's also positive. And this is where she and Bill Gates are in this incredible battle for how to envision a fossil fuel reduction or free world soon, right? And it's annoying because I listen to her stuff, Earth, democracy, it's all about, you know, sustainability and women. And then Bill Gates gets in there and it's all about bioengineering and men. And I just think that, come on guys, that's not common sense, right? Common sense is that you have, it depends, right? in this place at this time, in this product, blah, 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 blah. You should go with the uh, Shiva sustainability in this you know, place, on this issue, in this country, at this time, you should really go with the bioengineering or the solar panels or whatever. I just wish they would all both sit at a table and talk because it's clear to me that we can't go. We, we can't have our starting point being either that going back to sustainability will solve things or that engineering will solve everything. Um, so that, does that make sense to you, Soda? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we can't have like either or, it's just depend on context and the country and the social or geographical view. And, you know, we need to fit to the needs. Well, another way this gets, this kind of psychological dysfunction occurs. Well, Mr. Gore talked about in families, right? Where a father has these rules and it's so dysfunctional because people are people and they don't, they can't function. They just get more and more strapped into these um, straitjackets and nobody talks about it. It's just totally <laughs> crippling. But this is also where you can come in with religion, right? So religion, because it is ancient, can get fixated on something and really cripple people and not be able to adapt to what goes on. But on the other hand, the articles that I had you read on religion said that you don't have to throw the whole thing away. The basic values of these religions are very good for developing yeah. a, a society that is both sustainable and also promotes human flourishing. Yeah. I remember, uh, well, so like I had a, an, another course that I was more into like uh, Islamic law and like interpretation and all of that. 
So in that course, we would always like discuss about how uh, like religions and Islam, all of those texts gets translated and misrepresented. It's just like the intrinsic value and the morals behind them are always seem to be good, but we can't like ignore the context. So the society, when, when like the, well, in case of is, in Islam, when the prophet, like it was like hundreds of years ago that the society back then was really like completely different to the society we have now. And the circumstances are different. So the law and the decree that they would pass for back then, that time, would not be suitable for us. And all of the laws that would get passed down to the prophets, each of them are like in context of the certain situation. They come as a solution to that certain situation. So we can't really you know, take that law and apply it here when the context is completely different. So interpretation, like interpretation matters so much and how context matters so much as well. And that's like the biggest problem right now with religion that we're trying to apply rules straightforwardly according to like the book, whatever it is in, in like, instead of trying to understand it, we're just taking it word by word and just applying it without uh, studying the context, without uh, studying the intention behind those rules and what was the reasoning. Instead of that, we are just applying it blindly. And obviously there's people that would uh, uh, like, religious cleric that would like use that to their advantage and misinterpret things to gain what they want. And if the common people, they don't study their religion and they, they themselves stay ignorant, obviously they'll just blindly follow the clerics and clerics can do whatever they want because the people are not educated. So they would just blindly follow. And it's just like a whole mess because of certain misinterpretation. Yeah, actually, you know, that's a lesson from history too, is this has always happened. Um, it's the stakes are higher. That's, but so that's true. And, and then you were saying the intention matters. And that's why I gave you the, Aristotle's virtues and the UN capabilities is that that is what ought to be the intention, right? To maximize flourishing. Does that make sense, Soda? Yeah. And then you could hold a cleric accountable, right? Is your religious leadership promoting flourishing? Because, you know, we're made in the image of God and God wants us to flourish, right? So then you'd have a framework against which you could evaluate, right? So it's one thing to say you have to look at the interpretation, the context, and the intention. And then you have to say, but this is what the intention ought to be, some version of spiritual humanism. And the UN, right, we have organizations that have that standard. It's not like Professor Beck pulled it right out of her head. You better obey her. She should run the world or something like that. It's, um, that is what the UN should be held accountable. That's what the UN supposedly represents. So if somebody could show that the UN's policy on this or that doesn't promote flourishing, then the UN should change, right? because they're supposed to, they're, that's the gold standard. And then you can look at the religions or the clerics or things like that, so that you have a standard that um, they're accountable to. They can't just say whatever they want. Um, but the UN, already there are plenty of Muslims who have adapted the UN because they have thought of it as consistent with, Islam, and so they have 
picked out Islam or interpreted it with that intention because that they, they think that's God's intention and Muhammad as God's prophet, that was his intention. Um, so that would be, that's the final, like you have to kind of have some idea where you're going before you can evaluate someone's intention, right? Um, does that make sense to you, Sauda? Yes, Professor. Okay, and then for the rest of you, that's the way the course is organized, right? Now, it doesn't, it's fine with me if you decide that one of those classical virtues you disagree with. So, um, Ume, I don't know, there's lots of Umes, but uh, one, one of my students last year, she took environmental ethics. She did not like Aristotle's sociability. She said, no, you know, this adapting, this not criticizing people, uh, you know, I disagree with that. Like you have to be outspoken. And, and that's true. You know, I, I'm fine with that, Ume, uh, as long as you give me good reasons. Um, so again, it's just, it's the, the starting point for what your intention should be. But it also is right linked exactly to the UN that's a major player or ought to be a major player in development. Um, which brings me to one more point. If you remember that when I wrote, when I discussed that capabilities model, the very last part of number 10, right? The last point, there was subcategory A and B. The last one was the capability of owning property <laughs> and making money off your property. So the whole thing was quality of life. And then incidentally, you have to have an economic system to feed all this. Well, of course, capitalism turns the whole thing upside down. If you let capitalists cultivate the earth and everything, it'll all trickle down and everybody will be peachy keen and happy. Right. Um, so that is a major problem, you know, that if you have these two scenarios um, and that's why, again, I think reading philosophy is important. How come you've got this incredible clash between the UN and the capitalist system? Well, look at the philosophy. <laughs> They are exactly 180 degrees apart, and that's why. So, um, so yeah, so that's the intention. What is the intention of international capitalism? And it was advertised as, oh, everyone's going to flourish. We're going to have this middle class all over the world. And, um, and she's just saying, no, you know? It probably was never the people on top's intention, but even if it was, it was uh, misguided and tragic and it's not been that way and it's not going to be that way because uh, this kind of development always depends on a class that's being exploited and also natural resources are being exploited. Um, it's never included um, true equality because in order to make money, you've got to have a source of cheap labor um, and dispensable labor. You've got to be able to fire people at will in order to keep growing the economy. So on that capitalist view, just a larger and larger economy, domestic product is the goal that's considered flourishing. And she's saying, no, because it doesn't measure that the money is not being distributed and also that it's nature is looked at as an externality. And I had you read another article about value added and, and value distributed. Um, but anyway, so that was, I don't know, so that, does that help at all or? add to what you were saying? I just started talking a lot. 
No, it's okay, Professor. Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> okay. So, Anindita, are you there? Okay. Anindita, I'm suspicious. Like every day I see your picture and I don't hear from you. And so, you know, <laughs> I'm gonna, I just, I don't know if I've ever had a student that seems to just turn on her camera and disappear. And I don't get emails and I don't get chats. So, you know, I don't like to be hard nosed, but I think I'm gonna call it unexcused absences unless I hear from you. Um, because the other students, I really, most of it is excused absences, I just assume, but I don't like it. <laughs> I think somebody's just playing with me. Okay, um, Jamie, what have you got? Yes, Professor. Did you have uh, some comment about the reading for today? No, Professor. Okay. Um, Shamima? No? Do you have a, okay. Can you chat something? Okay. Okay, she didn't read it. Didn't read it. Um, and Fahima, are you there? Fahima, are you connected? She might not be because of um, Afghanistan. Um, okay, so I think um, it's just, how much more can we say? So I will once, I'll do one more round of going through the way the class fits together. That'll be about 15 minutes. And I think I'll just let you go because there's what? One, two, two people, uh, three people total who actually came prepared and one of them had to go. So this is kind of the lowest of the low at this point. I'm sure glad Shazneen appeared, um, but that's the way it is. And um, I'll just summarize it for people who need to do, who are on the YouTube. And I'll summarize what the final class, when it is, what I'm looking for. I have the same office hours which is um, what, Thursday, Sunday? Yeah, Thursday, Friday, Saturday morning, the same usual time. Um, okay, so we started out the class with the modern industrial era, the paradigm. Knowledge is power and nature is silly putty. Francis Bacon, was right out there. This was a mission statement. He's not hiding, he's not embarrassed. This is going to save the world, right? This is his idea of the good. John Locke, his, he's throwing out inherited wealth. That's been this terrible ball and chain on Europe. It's why they can't become democratic. It's why there's this huge gap between the rich and the poor. And he was an advisor to the United States founding fathers. Um, he lost all of his property for that reason because he was a traitor. <laughs> but in his mind, if you can get rid of that, the United States was going to be this great enlightenment experiment. The earth was silly putty. We're going to build it up, give it value. And he knew that the science and industry applied science that was coming out at his time was going to lead to more and more industry, more and more technology, more 
more efficient ways of exploiting natural resources. He knew that he was really excited about it, right? So they really thought that God <laughs> ordained that Columbus discover America because then these enlightenment thinkers had their experiment, right? They could really make good on their ideas that God wants uh, everyone to flourish. So democracy, the constitutional government was the next stage in social evolution and its economic foundation was going to be natural resources. So that was an enlightenment, you know, vision of the good. Then you had um, Immanuel Kant. He was also part of the Enlightenment, but he had this dualism. So in the article we read for today, she refers to reductionism, dualism, and oh my gosh, the third thing was also, let me see, I'm gonna find it. Because reductionism is utilitarianism, dualism is Kant, and then the third one was Locke. But I don't know if, um, if you can make those associations. Um, let's see, I guess, I guess I, yeah, I do have a lot to talk about. So I'm gonna give you a break. Um, why don't I give you a 10 minute break and then we will be done by uh, 10 o'clock your time. Is, uh, is that all right, guys? Because I think it would get a little long if I talked another 40 minutes, which knowing myself, I might do. So take 10. I have five after, so it'll be 25 after, and then you'll have time to do your post because um, I'll let you out over an hour early. I do want to refer to some of the ideas in this article. Um, the importance of, okay, development was to have been a post-colonial project, right? The idea is we're going to get over colonialism, right? Um, you, there was a model of progress, the entire world remade itself, um, the entire world remade itself on the model of the colonizing modern West without any subjugation and exploitation, right, of other people, right? The assumption was that the Western style progress was possible for all and it uses um, development meant the westernization of economic categories of what you need, of what it means to be productive and what it means to have growth. So again, productivity was all man-made productivity, right? When nature is very productive, right? Trees uh, produce, you know, um, all sorts of stuff and bees and nature is productive, but we don't give nature any credit. And now we take away nature's capacity to be productive and we try to replace it with human made production and it just doesn't work. It's seriously flawed. Um, let's see. All right, let me see if there's any. Yeah, cash crops are a terrible problem. Um, so instead of having the land used to make food for the locals, you have cash crops. <laughs> and the other thing is that now people who could be eating this healthy food right off the land, not only does it get planted with cash crops and sold, but those people have to buy food that has been um, processed. It's not as high quality, but they're buying into it too. I remember in Indonesia, um, you know, there was the 
banana trees and the coconut trees and plants were growing all over the place. And there was a lot of rice around, but people would go to these little tiny little kiosks and buy all this junk food, you know, that was in the little packages. And I thought, oh, this is just awful because it was cheap because, you know, it was produced, mass produced, but their health, like their, their health is going to deteriorate for two things. They're eating way less healthy food and they're not exercising anymore. And so um, the man I worked with in Bangladesh, his father was a farmer and we went and visited his father. His father was in much better physical shape than he was. And um, so, I don't know, it's, and it, it all goes back to that, the way you understand an economy, right? The people who just ate the food that was right in the yard or in the fish pond are not productive and they're not contributing to the gross national product. And they're lazy <laughs> instead of being rational and industrious. They're just being lazy. Um, oh my gosh, you know, such a set of categories. I mean, you get brainwashed, right? You have to be very careful not to get brainwashed. Um, but she uses these three words. Yeah, reductionism is that you reduce everything to, okay, our generation, Sauda says, grew up consuming formula in food. Uh, formalin, professor. Oh, what uh, is so, that? So it's, it's, uh, <laughs> so it's very, um, it's a chemical that uh, they use to keep uh, food fresh. So fruits, oh. vegetables, everything, uh, fishes, meat, anything that's raw food, they would keep it. So it it's the same thing, Professor, that we, that we use in a biology lab of, uh, to keep all of the organs uh, intact, right? That's formaldehyde. It's probably similar chemical to formaldehyde. Is that right? Yes, Professor. Yeah, and they use that same chemical, just in like a smaller amount in fresh foods to keep it fresh longer. It's that only. That's the only purpose, Professor. Nothing else. And that even in Bangladesh, it it became like a really huge issue. It be, it got so worse that people were dying from eating this formalin food. Like they use it as preservative, but it's like really harmful for our body. And some uh, like uh, businessmen, they would use it in towns like without any uh, limit. And it would, it would end up uh, eventually getting the consumer sick. And then the national, like the government had to put in some rules and okay, did they, did they put in some laws? Did they make laws? Yes, Professor. There was like limitation, but still people uh, did it anyway, you know. Well, I mean, the thing about laws is that like the legislators can make the laws because it'll make them look good, but if they yeah. aren't enforced, right? So yeah. if you have no enforcement agency, which again is a bureaucracy, it costs money. Plus, if the if the uh, capitalists bribe, right, bribe the enforcers, or if there aren't enough enforcers, right, then you think that the legislators, I mean, they passed the law looking good, but they knew it was never going to be enforced. Um, so that, yeah, is that kind of thing happened too, that they, they yes, can't. Professor. Yeah. And it's just, it's still, it's, they, like uh, business owners still use it and like we know that it's being used like for my me uh, for our our family like my mom whenever she buys fresh food uh, like uh, fruits or vegetables whatever she'll just keep uh, like for first one before like cooking them or just giving us it to us for eating and stuff she would uh, like uh, put them in like a really Submerge them in water for like one hour, two hours, just to 
get that chemical out of the food and then she would pick it up and then uh, wash it again and then cut it and give it to us like that's like became and like a common practice now because we know that there's formalin in food and it's not good for our body so soak it in water and try to get it out as much as possible before we eat it yeah yeah the the most notorious example well just I used to drink uh, um, pop that had artificial, it had aspartame. And a friend of mine said that when that gets in your body, it turns to formaldehyde. <laughs> and that kind of did it for me, but it it's very addictive. I don't know if you've ever had um, orange, orange pop that um, has aspartame, but it's designed, of course, to be addictive. And they interviewed one of the guys that sold it once. And he's, he had all these fancy words for it. He said, well, the memorabilization and the do -do, 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 do do you know? <laughs> and the interviewer said, oh, you mean it's addictive? <laughs> he said, oh, no. You know? <laughs> and of course, it's designed to be that way. So, um, but the other, the most notorious example was Nestle that was selling formula and it was advertising to women that their breast milk wasn't good enough and they should really use Nestle formula. Did any of you hear about that? Does that still go on? Yeah, we heard, but I mean, I don't think it happens now, but we heard about it. Like nowadays, if you see baby formula in every bottle, everything that felt that they have to uh like it has to be written on the container that this uh, that that like women uh, like mother's milk is always better and this is not a, a suitable replacement it has yeah. to be written on the bottom right. and so what that, happened yeah what what happened is women used bad water right they mixed it with water that wasn't <laughs> you know, drinkable that had issues and then the babies just died. And so I remember that was decades ago, but I mean, we just boycotted Nestle, right? Until they stopped, that was a huge campaign. And I think it worked. I mean, there's so many of them that they, it doesn't work or they just come back 10 years later and they figure people forgot. But I think on this one, it's just a notorious example of how women suffer uh, more. I mean, it's not like men don't want to, you know, don't care if their kids die. But I mean, women, you know, I'm sure that it, it was agony for them when they were trying to do the good thing, right? They're trying to do what Nestle was telling them was the better thing. Oh, yeah. Like for there's like, a lot of examples here professor because i remember there was like a lot of years ago but i remember it i was young but i remember there was uh in like kids milk like uh the powder milk powdered milk that the mothers used for to feed the babies bottled milk those were they found um melamine in those it's uh, they just mix it with real milk, powdered milk, to, you know, I don't know, increase the contain and whatever. Anyway, it's like really bad for obviously the kids. It's not a food element. So it was like a big scandal then as well. And it's always, I feel like whenever there's a big scandal and what, whatever is found out, it's always either women or it's always kids kids product, women product, it's always something wrong with them. Yeah, that's, that's terrible. Um, so what the article refers to reductionism, duality and linearity. Okay, so what do those words mean? So this is on page 164. So what I'm hoping, you know, is that you can read these articles and see this history because she's thinking about that. So reductionism would be that uh, empiricism of 
Bentham, right? Just pleasure, pain, and happiness. And so this reductionism of um, what people consider development, it, it, you know, pleasure, pain, and happiness. And it, you can convince people that this is what's pleasant and this will make you happy. And um, so that's been a huge influence. And dualism, that's Kant, right? Um, the separation of uh, nature from the mind. So you use reason to impose your categories onto the world. And then um, linearity, it, linear, that history is linear, this belief in progress, right? We're always moving forward. That those are all left over from the enlightenment and they persist, right? And Bill Gates has some of that, right? He, he finally accepts climate change as an issue, but he approaches it in this very enlightenment way. And he doesn't apologize for that. Oh my gosh. His best friends write books about enlightenment now, you know, science, technology, and they're so anti-religion, right? So they're coming out with all these books because they've, they're just demonized religion, right? <laughs> It's getting in the way of our science. And um, they just, they're just blind. They just can't see that it's more nuanced than that. And I don't understand why, you know, Vandava Shiva has a, a following, why he can't compromise, why they can't come to the table and work together. Um, I mean, maybe they can at this point. I don't know. I can't keep keep up with all of that. That's why my students have to write papers for me so that I can find out all this stuff. Um, so nature and women are turned into passive objects to be used and exploited for the uncontrolled and uncontrollable desires of alienated man, which alienated from nature. And then it's not man per se. There are women who totally buy into this and there are men who don't. But in general, the nurturing principle versus the control principle. Um, all right, let's see. Oh yeah, the GNP measures things like pollution control, right? If you invent this product, to uh, control air pollution, you increase the GNP and somebody gets rich. Well, why don't you just prevent it, right? There's no economic reward for preventing problems. Um, the same with health. Um, there's no reward for keeping people well. You know, we really make money when you get them sick. Um, So women's, uh, yeah, women's work in the collection of water, fodder, and fuel is rendered more energy and time consuming. That's a, just a big deal. Um, the average person in the world has the equivalent of 50 slaves. Well, why, right? The U.S. has 250 times more than the average Nigerian. Why, what do they mean? They mean that when I'm sitting there and eating a plate of food, somebody said the average American, when they're eating an average plate of food, it went around the world 150 times because all the products in it <laughs> got shipped. And so that's, that's where, and most of that labor was done by slaves, you know, people who get paid very little. Um, Okay, so self-built housing, uh, handmade garments of natural fiber, um, millet is far superior to processed food. So you don't have to romanticize getting back to living in a cave or something. You can just be very matter of fact about that we just really have to stop assuming that reductionism, whatever 
makes people feel good is what makes them happy and that dualism we have to exploit nature and then progress just infinite progress uh, we really have to stop stop these habits of mind um, i guess one more example from the last part of the article from last time was the fact that um i hope you remember this um the example was of self-interest okay let's see there was okay ragi there's a thing called ragi um so there was ddt was used in europe and it was poisoning the soil and it was having an effect on mother's milk right so they were saying oh there's ddt in mother's milk and so some uh it was germans german entrepreneurs are going to go to South India and produce this safe and wholesome food, right? It's they don't have DDT there. We're going to produce this food, ragi, right? And so a special millet grows on this certain part of India and called ragi. It needs little water, no fertilizer, and it's poor people's cheap subsistence food contains all the nutrients an infant needs. And so she, this German woman said, we need to get that, right? It should be processed and canned and sent to Germany. And um, it would, then somebody pointed out to her, you know, if you do that, then the women, the people there, it won't be, there won't be any, or it'll be really expensive. So they won't be able to feed their babies this food. And she didn't care, you know, because this is so important. Um, that's eco colonialism, right? And she's, she just thought of in the time it takes for Germany to ban the use of DDT and to get mother's milk, you know, back high quality again. We just can't do that. We got to do this right now. And so she was only concerned with the interests of mothers in Germany. And she was willing to sacrifice the interests of poor women in Southeast Asia. She thought it would be okay because they'd pay money for it, right? We'll pay them money, you know, they'll get rich. Um, but the money would never buy the same healthy food for Southern Indian women's infants that they now had free of cost, right? It's just this way of thinking that as long as I'm willing to pay these people, they should be happy because, you know, money, that's the way to get anything. That's, that's a higher quality of life. And it's just not. Um, so, so those are the kinds of mentalities that I, I hope, you know, I keep going over it. The other uh, thing is that she quoted from Rosa Luxemburg about that capitalism requires um, an exploited class. Rosa Luxemburg was a major player in Marxist movements. And so she's got this Marxist analysis. So we have, you know, all of those, those people we talked about in the first part of the class are directly or indirectly being referred to here because they're all, those ways of thinking are still alive and well. And then we went through the religious thing. Is religion any sort of out? So you are going to be writing your own environmental ethic. And so, I, you know, you can include anything you want. It's creative activity. If you want to bring in articles you've read on your own, or if you want to use the time you have to go find another article because you're really interested in something, it's, it's a free-for-all, right? And you, if you want to meet with me about your outline, I like to do that, but I don't require it because I know there's too many students have too many obstacles. Um, and that's just one more stressor for them if they feel like they're not meeting the requirements of the class. Um, and I can't make a video of a paper conference with you, right? So I don't require it. Um, 
Then there was the deep ecology, these, these ideas that sound good, but then when they actually get implemented, they're not good. So deep ecology was we should respect nature as intrinsically valuable, blah, blah. Well, it was Arne Ness, a Norwegian, it was Westerners. And so they're gonna go out to the developing countries and preserve some of the wilderness because the West has already sort of destroyed its wilderness, but we'll go to these other countries and we'll have wilderness protection. And it's just, you kick poor people off the land. When the poor people had these sustainable practices, right? It wasn't them, they weren't the ones created the problem. Um, so again, it all goes south and it turns into this gap between the rich and the poor. And it's a gap between, uh, the, between wealthy Western women and poor women in developing countries. And now it's even the gap between elites in each developing country and then the non-elites in the developing country. Um, biodiversity is a big issue. So this article, again, if you preserve biodiversity, you preserve all these um, assets. That, and that article had a list of a number of assets that nature does. Nature is productive. Nature provides us with sustainable you know, supplies unless we treat nature as silly putty and just keep exploiting it, then we lose overall productivity, but we don't admit it because it's not part of our worldview. It's not one of our categories. Our, the category productivity necessarily means when human beings have worked up the land. So it's a completely <laughs> inaccurate definition and it's getting more and more dysfunctional, more and more removed from our actual experience. Um, overpopulation, if you remember, is a big issue. The tragedy of the commons, where if you have the land as used in common, each farmer gains the most from having, you know, four cows, except that if you have 16 cows, pretty soon uh, all the grass gets eaten and it it isn't sustained and everybody dies. So Garrett Hardin says, yeah, that's why we have to separate, right? We can't have equal access to the commons. We have to have private property and those private owners are going to make sure their land stays, stays sustainable. They're not gonna let all these people in. Well, the trouble is obviously private landowners don't necessarily keep, they keep, they, they don't allow nature to engage in its kind of productivity. And so even private property isn't solving this problem. Um, let's see, and then lifeboat ethics, Garrett Hardin says, don't let everyone into the lifeboat or it'll sink. And then the answer to that is, that isn't the way the world works, right? Poor people aren't just gonna watch the rich people walk away with everything. Uh, there's gonna be instability and animosity and there's gonna be trouble. Um, plus women have fewer children if they know the ones that they have are going to get food, clothing, shelter, healthcare, education. And so the best way uh, those authors said one, one of the best ways to reduce population is to educate women and provide poor families with the basics. And that's, you know, AUW is founded on that kind of philosophy. Um, then there's the reality of climate change and then the, the free market capitalism, denial of, of what's going on. Again, that model, they have this model that is superimposed on nature and it just can't account. They can't address those facts because this model in their heads just, you know, <laughs> they can't see it. Or they, they just, it becomes more and more dysfunctional like Al Gore said. It's just like a father who just 
keeps on with these rules and the family gets more and more crippled and there's all these signals that this isn't right, uh, but they can't get past it. Um, so then I, there was an article about advertising. And then finally, you know, the effect of all of this on women and the way women get advertised to and exploited. So, um, so I hope that you can understand how all this stuff fits together and you can write your own view and you can f find some research project that's of real interest to you. So um, my number one priority is that you say things you really think that you'll remember and you'll keep adding to and that you find some research project that you really want to know about. Um, because that's what, you know, the class just gives you time and college credit to explore a subject that I think and that the school thinks is something we want our students to know about. And then, um, hopefully they take the class because they think it's worth knowing about. And then I just give you a chance to tell me why you think it's worth knowing and what you think is worth knowing about it and what you make of it and how you wanna orient yourself moving forward so you can make this part of your way of life. It's just part of your philosophy. You can have a philosophy of education, you can have a philosophy of healthcare, but this is your philosophy related to your, your relationship to the natural environment. Um, any questions? Because if there aren't, you know, I will let you go.